Shall we give the Lord a clap offering, church? Hallelujah. It is always a joy and a privilege for us to study God's Word together. Now, this week is an exciting week for us as a church as we prepare our hearts for the IDMC conference. I know that you have been praying for this conference, and I know that many of you have registered for this conference. Now, if you haven't registered, I humbly ask that you see the link on the screen, type it, and register today. Not only that, help us by forwarding this to your friends through email or social media, your WhatsApp, so that we can get more people to hear the call of God that we need to come back to disciple making roots. Praise God. Now, I'm thankful to the Lord for this uh, opportunity to bring you a word in season. Now, this message is part of our conference messages. As it's leading up to the conference, I, we will give this as a bonus session in our conference. So I want to talk about three keys to church revitalization. It is taken from Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. Three keys to church revitalization. I want to ask this one fundamental question. What is the purpose of the church? What do you think is the goal of the church? And what do you think is the mission of the church? See, these are terms that sometimes we use interchangeably and we think they all mean the same thing. It doesn't. Let me define the terms for us as we consider it in the IDMC church. What is the purpose of the church? The purpose of any church, it exists to glorify God. We exist as a church to glorify Him. Hallelujah. What is the goal of the church? The goal of the church is Christ-likeness. In other words, becoming more and more like Jesus. We win people. We help them to become followers of Christ. We teach them the Word of God until they are mastered by Christ so that they can one day become like Christ. Becoming more and more like Christ is the goal. What is the mission of the church? The mission of the church, even though you, you would say it's disciple making, it's true but inadequate. It is not just disciple making of people, but it's discipling the nations. That's the great commission that Jesus left us to do, to disciple the nations, hallelujah. See, you and I, we need to catch this. Nations are upon the heart of God. God wants to call the whole nation unto himself. That's why as an IDMC church, we believe our mandate and mission that God has commissioned us to do is this. For God's glory, we are commissioned to call churches all across this beautiful nation of Australia and beyond back to their disciple-making roots. That's the main reason why we do a conference. We do a conference not only to help our own members catch the vision and the mission of this movement, but to call churches back to the disciple-making roots, the main mission and agenda that Jesus left us to do on earth. Hallelujah. So this is the key thing that we are focusing on in our IDMC conference. Praise God. Now for this morning's sermon, I want to talk about the three keys to church revitalization from Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. The key question to consider today is this. How can we be the church in Christ that makes a difference in the nations? See, we are called to be a blessing to the nations, but how can we be as a church make a difference among the nations? Or the other way we can ask this question is, how can we maximize the kingdom opportunities during this pandemic and prepare the nations for great revival? Or the third way we can ask this question is, how do we bring a rev revitalization within a stagnant church? See, we are going to use this sermon as a bonus session in the IDMC conference. So if you're watching from a church that is stagnant, currently going through a phase of struggle, this question is pertinent. How do we bring a revitalization within a stagnant church? But if you are a church that's doing well, and you are looking at this pandemic and we are saying, how can we maximize the opportunities? See, in this pandemic season, there are plenty of opportunities for the kingdom of God to advance. How do we do digital church? How do we do discipleship digitally in the online world? How do we grab the opportunities and maximize it for the kingdom of God? This is poignant for us. 
But for us as a local church, how can we be the church that makes a difference among the nations? For all these questions, the answer is the same. There are three keys to all these questions, and the three keys are found in one Old Testament text. I want you to go with me to Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 1 and verse 2. Let's read it together. If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me you should return. See, right there, the emphasis is to me you should return. If you want to return, then to me you should return. If you remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver, Verse 2, and if you swear as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. Hallelujah. The Lord says here, return to me, remove the detestable things, and if you swear to live in truth, in righteousness, and justice, then the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. How do we make a difference among the nations? The key is found here. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Open our eyes to see the beauty and the glory that is hidden in your word. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. We give you all the glory, praise, and honor. In Jesus' name, and the people of God said, amen and amen. So three keys to church revitalization. Number one, we got to return to God aright. We must return to God aright. Verse two, 1 and verse 2. Look at this. Let's read it again. If you return, O Israel, in other words, if you want to return, declares the Lord, then to me you should return. If you remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver, and if you swear as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. In these two verses, I love it when the Bible opens itself. Here you have a grammatical uh, structure. If, then, if, and, then. In other words, you could clearly see that the Lord is placing three conditions and one consequence if they follow that conditions. What are the three conditions? He says, if you want to return, in other words, if you desire to reignite the spiritual passion in your life, if you want to revive the stagnant church and take new ground, if you want to continue to make a difference among the nations, it always begins with returning back to God. And then he goes on to say, to whom you should return. You're not returning to a religious activity. See, disciple making cannot be reduced to just the disciplines that you follow. See, more than the disciplines, it is a devotion unto Jesus. You could do the, the, the disciplines of even Bible reading, scripture memory, and you can do the journaling without actually deepening your relationship with Jesus. You could do all this as religious activity without your heart ever be touched with love for Jesus. Listen to me carefully. He's not calling us to a religious ritual. He's calling us to a relationship with him. That's the first key I want you to catch. He says, come back to me. Hallelujah. And then he goes on to say, if you want to come back to me, there's a second condition. If you remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver. I want you to pay attention to this. This is the key to intimacy. See, if you really want to come back to God, then you have to deal with the idols of the heart. See, many times we only turn to God. We don't return to God. We keep the bridges that we, there, there are bridges behind us. We don't burn those bridges. Why? Because we only turn to him when we are in crisis, but we don't return to him completely. We don't come back to him wholeheartedly. We don't return to him totally. Here Jesus says, come back to me. God says, he invites us to intimacy. He says, come back to me. Don't turn back. Don't waver. See, you and I, we need to understand the call of God in this season for us is come back. And when you come back, 
don't waver, don't change your course, don't go back. Thirdly, he says, if you swear as the Lord lives in truth and justice and in righteousness. In other words, he says, if you want to come back to me, you got to learn to walk in integrity, walk in truth, walk in justice, walk in righteousness. And this is the key to world evangelization. Why? Because if the church returns back to God, if the church is willing to throw away all the, destroy all the idols of the heart and the church does not waver, but the church is committed to walking in integrity, walking in truth, walking in righteousness. Then the Bible says, the nations shall bless themselves. Hallelujah in him. In other words, you and I, we need to understand that the church cannot disciple the nations if it loses its own spiritual fervor, if it loses its own spirituality. If you're spiritually cold as a church and if you have lost your passion, you have lost your testimony, how can you boldly declare repentance, a call to repentance unto the nations? So what Jesus is saying to us first is that you and I, we need to come back to him. Hallelujah. Now, as a pastor, when we are working with individuals in the church and you observe that they need to change, they need to return. We all know that change they change, but they don't last in that change. <clears throat> My spiritual father and mentor, Pastor Edmund Chan, came up with this framework, five truths about change. He says, people should change. It's true, isn't it? We all know there are things that we need to change. The second thing is, not only knowing that you need to change, people can change. It's one thing to know you should change. It's another thing to know that you have the ability to change because God is invested in you changing. He wants to work in you to change. There is a change from the inside out that God longs for. So people should change and people can change, but people don't change. If you observe many times, even if you are in an IDMC church, it takes a good three to four years sometimes for the penny to drop and for the heart to become open for the Lord to do a deeper work. You could be in a church that preaches the word of God. You, you could be in a church where the spirit of God is actively transforming lives. And yet people don't change. You know why they don't change? It's because the fourth one, people won't change. It is the stubbornness of the human will. It's the stubbornness of the heart. It's the hardening of the human heart. There are things that needs to be dealt with, detestable things that need to be removed, but they don't because people won't change. And even if they give a token change, the fifth one is people short change change. In other words, they do make a turn, but they don't completely return. Or even if they change, the change doesn't last longer. Why? They short change change. In other words, you see them down the track six months, one month, six months, one year later, you see them go back to the default mode how they were before. The reason is because they shot change, change. That's why the call of God here is for the Israel to come back. So this text was Jeremiah speaking to Israel. See, Jeremiah predominantly ministers to Judah. He was based in Jerusalem and he speaks to Judah, the kingdom of Judah. But in this text, God actually calls him to speak to Israel. Israel at this time, um, a time of writing, was already in exile. The Assyrian captivity had already taken place in 722 BC, and they had been in captivity for nearly 100 years. But still, God calls them back to himself. See, the Bible says it's not just here, but in, it also is mentioned in chapter 3 and verse 12. Go and proclaim these words towards the north, towards the north is Israel. And say, return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. In other words, God was so gracious and merciful, he looks to Israel and he says, return, come back. And in verse 13, he says, only acknowledge your guilt that you rebelled against the Lord your God. All he's asking is, come back. In other words, the key message I want you to capture this morning is this. It's never too late for us to repent. Until Jesus returns, there's an opportunity for you to return. And today is the day for repentance. Today is the day that you can return completely back to him. And all you have to do is to acknowledge the guilt. Lord, I have 
walked away from you. I have rebelled against you. There's hardness in my heart. There's stubbornness in my will. Help me. And the Lord says, I will. I will show you mercy. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, the key thing in this I want you to observe is even though he's speaking to Israel, the same word goes on to Judah as well. In chapter 3, in verse 10, the Bible says Jeremiah, God spoke through Jeremiah to Judah, and he says, Yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, but in pretense declares the Lord. In other words, what God was calling them to do is not just confess that you need God, you need to come back to Him, but come back totally, come back completely, come back wholeheartedly. But the sad state is they came back in pretense, the Bible says. Even though it is not too late for us to repent, that repentance, when you do it, it has to be a genuine repentance. And that genuine repentance meets with genuine change in our life, where we remove the detestable things that the Lord wants to remove from our lives, where we destroy the idols of our heart and we come back to Him and pledge our allegiance and our loyalty to Him. And that genuine change will bring a divine blessing among the nations. Hallelujah. Now, how do we do this? How do we return to Him completely? That's the second point and the third point. Look at what it says in the second one. What is the three keys to church revitalization? One is to return to God aright. Secondly, we got to replow the ground aright. That's verse 3 and verse 4. Let's look at verse 3. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. I love this phrase, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Let's break one by one. Break up your fallow ground. What's a fallow ground? See, fallow ground is a ground that is tillable, but it's not yet tilled. It's a ground that needs to be plowed before the farmer can sow the seed. In other words, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's stating the obvious. Agriculturally, a farmer would never sow a seed in a ground that is not plowed. Why? Because a hardened ground, the seed cannot survive. The, the ground needs to be softened. So this is not only speaking about an agricultural metaphor, but it's speaking about our spiritual life. He says, how do you return back to God? How do you start the process? The first thing is to break the fallow ground, break up the fallow ground. In other words, we need to soften a hardened heart. Now, how many of you realize that it's, it's uh, our heart, the Bible says, need to be broken. A contrite heart, the Lord does not despise. A broken heart. In, in IDMC Church, we call it the brokenness of God. What is the brokenness of heart? Brokenness is defined like this for us. Three things. One, it is the stripping of self-reliance. Lord, I don't want to rely on myself anymore. I want to rely on you. A brokenness is a desperate need for God. Acknowledging I can't, only He can. You know, many times in our lives, we want to return back to God, but then we always want to rely on our own self. We want to take back the control of how we do life. How do we handle our finances? How do we handle our marriage? Listen, when do we realize, when, when, when we don't realize that we can't, only He can. That's the brokenness. The brokenness to recognize, my Lord, I have pride in my heart. I have self-reliance in my heart. I can't. I need to be broken. My hardened heart has to be plowed again. See, this was, uh, uh, the word there is actually break up the fallow ground. It's a ground that was plowed before, but now is hardened and it needs to be replowed. That's why he's saying, come back to that place to re replow the ground. In other words, you got to prepare the soil before you start to do things. It, and the brokenness is this. First is the stripping of self-reliance. Secondly, it's the shattering of self-will. You come to that place where you recognize, God, it is not my will, but your will. You know how hard it is? Apostle Paul writes and he says, the good I want to do, 
I end up not doing. The evil I want to do, I end up doing. There's such a wretched man I am. Who will set me free from this wretchedness? Paul cries out. It's a struggle for the great apostle. How much more for you and me? The stripping of self-reliance, the shattering of self-will, and then the softening of our human heart, the softening of our heart to be able to say to God, yes, Lord. See, whether you're a Jonah who's running away from God and God is calling you to come back to him, you have to go through a process of brokenness. God took him to the depth of the ocean to break him, to bring that brokenness in him. See, I want you to listen to me carefully. Many times we desire breakthroughs in our church. We desire breakthroughs in our family, in our spiritual walk, but breakthrough can't happen until this. That's why in all our breakthrough weekends, we talk about these four things. When God breaks in, how does God break in? He breaks in with his word. And we break with, we break with our sins. When God breaks in with his word and we break with our sins, things that hold on to us, things that we are holding on to, when we are removing our idols, the detestable things from our lives, what happens? Then we have breakthrough so we can break forth. Sometimes there must be a refreshing that needs to come, a renewing that needs to happen. But long before that renewing needs to happen, there has to be a softening of that heart. There needs to be stripping of that self-reliance. There needs to be shattering of that self-will. There needs to be, the ground needs to be plowed. Otherwise, the Bible says, the word of God will not be fruitful. See, this is where many times in churches, you find that, The church wants to move towards a new direction. Oh, we want to be a disciple-making ministry. And then they start the process. And then they are hit with so many roadblocks. And the roadblocks is not systems or structures or the capacity of people. The roadblocks is the heart of the people. Because the heart of the people have not been plowed, has not been softened. Hallelujah. I want you to listen to me carefully. That is why I want you to think about this. This is the great spiritual neglect. Many times the reason why we neglect it is because that is hard work. A farmer knows to plow the field is a necessary work, but it's also a hard work. You know, if the farmer is a a rich farmer, he will have tools, the right tools to do the plowing. What are the right tools? You know, the plow needs to be put on two oxen and or maybe a few oxen if you're rich enough or a mule. But if you don't have those resources, then this is what the farmer will do. He knows it's a necessary work, but it's a hard work, but I don't have the tools. What do I do? I start with myself. I take the plowing tool and I start to carry it and plow the field myself. Maybe my wife and my children might stand behind me and push, but it's hard work, but it's a necessary work. This is what you and I, we need to pay attention to. That's why sometimes we give up and we just say, let's do what works because we have hit an a, a, a obstacle. But the Bible is very clear. You cannot ignore this. And while the farmer is plowing, he will hit a big rock sometimes. He can't just leave the big rocks. He has to dig deeper this time. He has to pour more energy this time until that big rock will loosen and then he can remove it so that he can continue plowing the land. Listen to me. There are big rocks that hinder the work of the Lord in our churches. There are big rocks that hinder the work of the gospel in our families. There are big rocks that are hindering the work in our own heart. We need to take time to deal with it. That's why the Bible calls us to come back to him, to return to God, all right? And return completely. How? By break up your fallow ground. And secondly, he goes on to say, so not among thorns. So not among thorns. You know, when you hear this phrase, so not among thorns, I want you to think about it like this. When you're walking around sowing seeds as a farmer and you see a portion of land that has thorns, he's not saying don't sow among thorns, so just avoid the, that area, just sow on the rest of the area. Is that what he's saying? Sometimes that's how we could misunderstand this metaphor. He's not saying avoid the areas where there are thorns. He's actually stating the obvious. 
In the agricultural society, a farmer will take time to remove the thorns first. So in other words, what this is saying is, remove the thorns in your life. When you want to return back to God, you not only plow the land and remove the big rocks, you also remove the thorns that are plaguing your life. Because the subtle danger is that we learn to live with the thorns and don't deal with it. That's the spiritual complacency. We know things ought to be dealt with, but we don't. We sweep it under the carpet. The fault lines will still remain. And it's waiting for the next big crisis. And when the crisis comes, all the fault lines appear. I want you to listen to me carefully. We got to deal with these thorns decisively. What are some of the thorns that you find in the local church or find in the human heart? One, there is doubts and unbelief. You know, sometimes when you, when you do some things long enough, you get jaded. You say, ah, it doesn't work. Or I don't think God has any plans for this. So there's unbelief at the heart. There's discouragement. The second one would be there will be discouragements and hurts. In other words, there are people who go through hurts and disappointments. I believed, you know, I was talking to a charismatic pastor one day. He's a elderly gentleman, much older, and he and his wife came for counseling. And as I was praying with them and I was walking with them, one of the key things the wife shared with me is, my husband had received so many prophetic words uttered to him by famous prophets when he was a young man, when he came into ministry. But over the years, we never saw the fulfillment of any of those prophecies. So there is a lot of disappointments and hurts in our hearts. How do you minister when, you're f when your heart is filled, weighed heavily by all these disappointments and hurts? That's what sometimes plagues us. These are the things that needs to be removed, that needs to be dealt with. Thirdly, unforgiveness, resentment, and bitterness. Sometimes it's just the hurt has gone to a place where it's become a personality clash and you don't want to talk to that person or you'd want to live in that unforgiveness and that causes resentment and bitterness. Becomes an acid that is eating up your soul. But sometimes it could be just insecurities, anxieties, and worry. You know, as a I have the privilege of journeying with many pastors. It doesn't matter what the size of the church is, whether you're a mega church pastor or a small church pastor, insecurities are found in the man of God. And these insecurities has to be dealt with in a godly manner. Because if you're an insecure leader, an insecure leader can really be a threat to everyone around him. An insecure person can really destroy a marriage, can destroy the health of a church. Insecurities, anxieties, worry. People worry about uncertain future. People worry about when this pandemic will be over. People are worrying about anxious about ill health. People are worrying and anxious about what would happen if this continues on for my business, for my church, for my ministry. Listen, these are things that we, are, we need to deal with. And then on top of that, it's a big rock, a big thorn is this, addiction and bondages. This addiction could be from a simple addiction of gaming, and sometimes gaming can become adverse. I've seen people's lives ruined because of gaming addiction. Gaming, pornography, alcohol, substance abuse. They could be even gambling. You know, I was reading a survey that was done in America. Among the people that were surveyed, this was going back a few years ago, they actually listed that people who claim to be Christians have gambled away nearly $318 million in casinos. And this, I want you to think about it, these are the detestable things people trusting in lottery systems, people trusting their money in casinos, people playing, gambling. Now it's much easier and accessible through online world. 
These are the things that are taking root and destroying our credibility, destroying our witness, destroying our relationship with God, destroying and corrupting our discipleship. If we really want to come back to God and we really want to deal with it, we got to deal with plowing the land again. Remove the thorns and deal with it decisively. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 22, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. The cares of the world, the riches, the deceitfulness of riches, they choke the word of God and it becomes unfruitful if you don't remove the thorns. Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, it says the same thing. As for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Why is there no fruit in our ministries? Why is there no fruit that glorifies God, a fruit that lasts and multiplies? It's because there is, it's choked by thorns, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and the pleasures of life. We have to deal with it decisively. You know, years ago in the IDMC conference, I shared a testimony from one of our believers in the church. Years ago, I went to drop Pastor Edmund and Pastor Anne at the airport when they were catching an early morning flight. After dropping them in Sydney airport, I was coming back home, but I became very hungry. So I decided to drive to the nearest McDonald's. And there I stopped the car, went in there to place an order for my breakfast. I ran into a person who had attended our church for a couple of months. I know him by name, but I don't know much details about their life. And when he saw me there, he was already holding his uh, breakfast. He said, Pastor, can I talk to you? I've been waiting for two months to talk to you. So I recognized in that moment that this is a divine appointment. So I placed an order for my breakfast. I took it and went and sat together with him. As soon as I asked him this question, so how are you? What do you want, what do you want to talk about? The moment I said that, he burst into a wailing sound. He burst into a wail. He was crying away. I was about to eat my breakfast. I couldn't eat my breakfast. I put it aside and I realized that God was doing a deep work. He has begun a deep work. So I asked him, would you please come with me to the car, to the car? So we went outside. He couldn't even walk. He was dropping right there in the car park. But I picked him up and brought him into my car. He's in the passenger seat. I'm in the driver's seat. And we started sharing. And he opened his life and he shared the pain that he had been holding on to. His family had come from a very small church. And in that small church, they had endured spiritual abuse. And there was so much anger, so much bitterness, so much pain in his life. So I let him just talk and, and let the Holy Spirit just do the work. And one by one, those big rocks, that he had never opened up to anybody came out. The thorns that had plaguing his life, the Holy Spirit gently removed it one by one. After about an hour and a half in that vehicle, I prayed for him, I committed him to the Lord, his family to the Lord, and then I said to him, don't drive until you are fully fine, and I've hoped that you're okay. And he said, Pastor, I'm okay because I met the Lord. That day, there was a breakthrough in his life. That day, there was a mighty turnaround in his life. And what caused that turnaround? That turnaround happened because he had an encounter with Jesus. He had an encounter with the love of God, with the Word of God, with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gently pointed to all the hurts and the pains and the thorns in his life. And as he was willing to surrender each of those thorns, the Lord just ministered healing and the balm of Gilead just removed one by one. Now the following week when I met him at church, he said, Pastor, I've got a breakthrough. 
the Lord had given me a breakthrough. Hallelujah. A month or two later, his whole family, his family, his, he and his wife came up and shared the testimony. Not only that, today that family is continuing to serve the Lord in the IDMC church. The reason I'm sharing this is because God wants to deal with the thorns in our lives. Our God is a loving God. That's why in an IDMC church, we call it the breakthrough weekends. And in the breakthrough weekends, all we do is not preach another sermon for people to say, oh, that was a great sermon. At breakthrough weekends, we go before God, we open the pages of scripture and allow the pages of scripture to read our lives so that it's like a mirror that we can look at our lives and see the big rocks that need to be removed, the hardened heart that needs to be plowed and the thorns that need to be removed. Because these are things that become the detestable things. These be things become the idols of our heart. Tim Keller in his book writes, the idols of the heart are like power, control, comfort, approval. Sometimes it's the power you're hungry for, wanting power and the power to hurt, power to take revenge, power to control everything. Sometimes it's the, the need to have a control, I need to be in charge when I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling anxious when I'm not in control. I feel angry when I'm not in control. That's a condition of the human heart. It's an idol. Sometimes it's the approval seeking. I want to be a man pleaser. I want to please everybody. I will never say no to anybody because it's all about pleasing people. I don't want to confront any issues because I'm a people pleaser, approval seeker. It's an idol to the opinions of men. Or it could be just a person who doesn't want to do anything. A person who seeks comfort, doesn't want to sacrifice, doesn't want to go the extra mile, doesn't want to put the energy and the effort that is required to build a godly life, to build a godly marriage, to build a godly future. Because it's an addiction to comfort. It's the idol of comfort. I am so comfortable here. I don't want to rock the boat. I just I leave it as it is. I'll just sow on the other areas, leave the thorns as it is. You know, in the IDMC conference, I shared this testimony. In that conference, after my session was over, I walked out to go to the toilet. And in front of the toilet, I saw two men crying and praying for one another. So I waited for them to finish because they were just, just next to the entrance. And they, they finished praying and they turned to me and we both with tears in their eyes, they said, we are father and son. We are both pastors in different churches. And the father said to me, maybe I need to see you at a McDonald's soon. There's hurts and pain that we carry. We need to deal with these things. How do we turn a stagnant church around? It starts with the heart, breaking up the fallow ground. It starts with removing the thorns. It starts with returning to God wholeheartedly. Thirdly, the Bible says this, we got to redirect our heart aright. Look at this in verse four. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Here, the Lord gives not only one condition, but he also gives one warning. I want to focus on the warning because lest my heart, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. See, we are living in the last leg of the last days and God is dealing with his church. The pruning of the church is taking place. God is purifying his church. That's why the fault lines are appearing. The scandals are surfacing. What people did in the hidden places are now being revealed. Why? because God wants his church to be pure and holy before he comes back. He's coming back to a bride that is holy and pure. Yes, we are forgiven. Yes, we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, but he will deal with, the, he will deal with sin thoroughly. We have been studying the book of Revelation and the book of Revelation, he keeps calling the church back to repentance, isn't it? And this is the key. So in light of that, 
He calls us to circumcise yourself to the Lord, remove the foreskin of your hearts. What does circumcise mean? For a, for a Jewish person, circumcision is a sign. In Genesis chapter 17, the Lord says to Abraham, I want you to circumcise all the males in your household. In other words, they are set apart among the nations to be a people for God. They are people of God among the nations. They are set apart. The word set apart means it's holy unto the Lord. For us, it's a sign to say that we are now set apart unto Jesus for his glory. He redeemed us. He paid the price. He bought us with his own precious blood. We, today, we belong to him. Even though we are not called to circumcise the foreskin, we are called to remove the foreskin of our hearts. In other words, it's a spiritual circumcision. And he's saying, set yourself apart completely for my glory, for my kingdom work. And this is the reason why I want us to pay attention to this. He says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskin of your hearts. See, God is not interested in us just coming back and saying to him, I want to return to you and just keep a token commitment and give a token commitment. He wants us totally. He wants us to wholeheartedly come back to him. And sometimes we can't come back to him wholeheartedly because there are thorns in our lives that needs to be dealt with. There are idols in our hearts that need to be removed. And if we don't deal with this, we could never come back to him totally. We could never circumcise our hearts completely to him. That's why we need his help. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, the Lord says, I will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God and with all your heart, with all your soul, and that you may live. It is God who has to do the circumcision work. It is the Lord who deals with it. That's why you and I, we need to come before God and be vulnerable before Him and to say, Lord, help me. Give me the grace to be circumcised in my heart. I want to humbly say this to you. Don't give up hope. If you're in a struggling in a, in a church, don't give up hope because the Lord is with you. Faithful is he who called you. He will bring that turnaround. But allow him to do that surgical work in your own life. Allow him to come and remove the big rocks from your life. Allow him to remove the thorns that are plaguing your life. Allow him to come and do that deep work that only he can do. And when he has done with you, when he is done with you, you will be a vessel of honor for his glory, for his good. Hallelujah. Today I come before you in humility and I say this. The Lord can do this in your life and he wants to do this. The same Lord who turned around our church. You know, I've been in this church now for 21 years. And as a senior pastor over the last 10 years. And as a church, I look back and I thank God for the way he transformed our church. And the way he has transformed our church from a dysfunctional church to be a disciple-making church. A church that was struggling and stagnant to a church that's flourishing and taking the nations. Only God can do that. It is not because of anything else, but it's a deep work that God does. And the work he does in the individual and the work he does in the church. I want to come before the Lord. And I want to pray for all of us. Would we go before the Lord and pray? Come, take a moment. I want you to put aside everything that you're doing. If you can kneel down, kneel down. If you can lift up your hands, come before God. Today is a day for us to come back to Him to say, Lord, I want you to do that deep work in my life. I want to reignite my spiritual passion. I want, to, I want the church to be revitalized. I want the church, my cell group, to be re-energized with the, with the work of the gospel. I want the Spirit of God to do the deep work in our lives. But I want us to deal with the big rocks. I want, us to, I want you to remove the thorns in my life. I want you to help me to destroy the idols in my heart. Come back to Him today. Just call upon Him and repent. The key thing He says is, if you want to repent. If you return to me, to me you must return. Come, cry out to him. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord 
and he will do the deep work. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this moment. I acknowledge your holy presence in this place. I acknowledge, mighty God, that you are speaking a word in season for people's lives. Lord, thank you for the testimony of uh, our dear brother that I shared. Thank you for the testimony in my own life that you have done. Thank you for the testimony of the change and the deep work you're doing in our church. Thank you, Lord. All this shows is that the Lord loves his church. The Lord loves his people. The Lord loves every individual and no situation is hopeless. Every situation, there is hope. In every situation, God can step in and bring transformation, bring change, and bring deepening of lives. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus for thorns to be removed right now. The thorns that are plaguing them from addiction and bondage, every stronghold in their heart, in their life, let it be gone in Jesus' name. Father, that gaming, that addiction, that pornography, that, that gambling, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that alcohol, that anger, that resentment, let it be gone in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Let that insecurity and Lord, all those things that's causing that anxiety and worry be gone in Jesus' name. I pray for that doubts and that unbeliefs to clear. And I pray, Father God, that you will remove that hurt and that disappointment. Let that healing come today. Let the balm of Gilead flow and bring healing. Let the mighty power of God come and break every yoke. Today, in the name of Jesus, we declare it's a day of deliverance. It's a day of breakthrough. Hallelujah. Father, I declare this over your people today. May their life be transformed by the power of your word. May their lives be transformed by the power of your spirit. May their lives be transformed because we have a gospel of Jesus Christ. He died for our sin. He took our place so that we can be released. He was condemned. He was rejected. He was abandoned. He was cursed, the Bible says, so that we can be blessed, we can be accepted, we can be received, we can be acknowledged before God as righteousness of God. Hallelujah. So in the name of Jesus, I declare before your people a mighty turnaround today. We give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Now, before I give you the benediction, there are numbers on the screen. I want you to type to us. If you had prayed that prayer together with me this morning, and if there is something that the Lord placed his finger in your life, I want to hear from you so that I can keep you in my prayer. There's an email address. There's a WhatsApp number. Write to us. And if you're going through a painful season, you are struggling with a big rock or a thorn in your life, you need someone to help you, do right as well. Because you can't sometimes come out of it by yourself. You need a community. You need people who can come alongside you. So open up your life to your life group members. And if you can't, then there are counselors available who can walk with you. So write to us so that we could point you to the right help and assistance for you. But we love you. We're praying for you. This week is a special week. It's a week leading up to the conference. So pray for the conference and gather people and let's watch. Let's participate together. Spread the word. The address is on the, on the, link, the link here. God bless you. We love you. Take care. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you shalom. Go in his peace, church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And the people of God said, amen. We love you.